Hello, hello. Nice hey, to see you again, dear Erica. You too, you too, France. Uh, welcome to everyone. This is our your bi-monthly installment of our Gallery 51 featured artist segment. I am Erica Wall and I'm the director of the Berkshire Cultural Resource Center here at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts and I have the pleasure of having with me uh, France Viana and she is an artist who I've actually had the pleasure of working with in the past and so um, you know as we've continued with this segment specifically at the beginning of our school year, we're focusing on artists who have immigrated to the United States in light of our Hostile Terrain 94 exhibition. And what we're hoping to do is by inviting artists from all over the world who have made the United States their home, that we can broaden the discussion about what the experience is for artists who come to the United States and have discourse through their work about their experiences here and how their background and culture reflects how they see themselves here in the United States. And so it is with great pleasure that I have Owen France Viana with us. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Erica, very honored to be here. Well, the, it's, it's a reciprocal experience. Um, we really enjoy you allowing us to come into your studio space and see your work and learn more about your practice. And as we always say, we have, 60 minutes, which goes by very quickly. So we've shared a little bit about you and your work on our website, and we invite everybody to go there and learn more about you. But we wanna take up our 60 minutes to actually talk with you and um, get some questions answered and to learn more about what you do. And as folks come in and out, um, we'll try and allow for questions. But I'm with what we usually start off with, Obviously, we know you're in the United States. Um, what part of the country are you in? I'm just, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm right at the other end, the north end of the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County. Wonderful. And so, France, tell us a little bit, if, um, if no one knew about you and your practice, how would you describe your work and give us a snapshot of your journey and your career within your practice. Well, I would really say that my approach to my work is storytelling. And I often start with a story. And uh, I consider myself a conceptual artist in that I am not tied to any medium. Most people are either painters or photographers or something like that. I think about what I want to say and what the story is. And then I find a medium to sort of fit it. And you're going to see that today. There's going to be a wide variety. Now that makes it a little different, uh, difficult sometimes for people to categorize me, but hopefully there's a theme running through everything that ties it all together. Okay. And so tell us about your 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 journey. I know that, you know, I'm glad that you alluded to the to how your practice spans different mediums. Yes. Tell us how long have you been practicing and um, what, where are you at this point in your, in your career? Well, uh, I've been, had the identity as an artist since I was seven. So I don't want to be, uh, reveal my age. So that was maybe 20 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> and anyway, hey, I, a few years ago, that's uh, three years, three or four years ago to be exact. You know, you you make art, you sort of figure your way around, and you try this, you try that, and you know, three or four years ago, I ended up with a birthday with a zero at the end of it. You know, one of those milestones, birthday, and I said, you know, I don't need another trip, I don't need another car, I don't need anything. What I really need is to take my art seriously. So I went back to school, I got my MFA, probably the you know, late in life, and it, it was really the best thing I ever did because I said there's something about this whole art world that there's a secret handshake. And you, you, I said, well, how can I learn this secret handshake? And so I went back to Mills College, uh, which is a very well known MFA school here in the East Coast. And, you know, it did the trick. It really, you're the one who has to take your art seriously and take it to the next level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so tell us a little bit about um, what you're working on right now. What I'm working on right now. Okay. 
Um, can I start with, because it's sort of a departure of my first series. No, can absolutely. I start there? Absolutely. Right. So these are my first series and I call them color palette. And what these are, uh, they look like alien landscapes. They look like a moonscape or, or some extraterrestrial, but actually they're close-ups of ice cream. And my grandfather, it's autobiographical because my grandfather founded one of the biggest ice cream uh, brands in the Philippines. And I like how food is a bridging of cultures. You know, like an alien landscape can look very far, but often our first entry into another culture is through the food. And I deliberately thought of something that ended up with this. And I was saying, I'm really envious of how uh, African culture has impacted modernism, right? From Picasso and all of that, how African culture really made its way into Western culture and changed it. And also like how uh, the Japanese culture informed the Impressionist. So I said, well, what about Filipino culture could inform modern art, right? And I looked into it and, you know, I didn't want to do the whole, um, the whole folk art, but I'm doing that now. But then I did it and I said, well, what is the one cultural trait or value that we bring with us when we come here? And it has to be this radical hospitality in the sense that Filipinos feed everyone. And Erica, you're part Filipino, you know. You know, it's like you cannot meet somebody without putting a plate of food in their hands. And so I said, how can I do this radical hospitality within the context of art? So I started making food-based art, but not food for the kind you ingest, but the kind that you express your cultural identity through. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And, so, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Well, I was just saying that I was really excited when ketchup overtook salsa as the most, um, the most popular condiment in the US. It's sort of to me what I like to call a reverse colonization or a, maybe a revenge colonization when you know the other culture comes back to the dominant colonizer and changes it in some mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think you know that's what I enjoy most about your work is how you emphasize that bridge that is created with the food, but it's not, you, you have such a creative sense of how to deliver that message and the way in which, exactly. So I had the pleasure of showing your work in my gallery and it went on to a museum exhibition at Asia Society, Texas. So we got a chance to work often and in different scales as well. And I think that that is what, um, well, that is what conceptual art can do is challenge the way in which we perceive something. But I think what you're talking about, the context of how we actually push these cultures and create these hybrids, and then what the after effect is, is part, yeah. is part of what I see your practice and the research that you conduct for your practice. And so tell us how that's evolved since the time that we have talked, that Ube sign in the exactly. back I'm part of our exhibition. That. Yeah, so talk to so, us about that. So you know Albert's homage to the square, of course, right? Right. And like my practice has always been centered on color. I actually got through Ube and all of that, not through the food, but through the color, because I'm just so impressed by how purple it is. Mm -hmm. And so for years, for years, I started thinking, how can I sort of riff on this homage to the square? And how can I do the purple color of Ube in a way that sort of reflects this? And I, I tried some literal things, you know, I tried, I tried working with prints and with plates and with cakes. And I, literally, it was a two year search for a way to express it. And one day, I happened to come out with a loaf of bread that was squarer than usual, you know, and so it didn't have that little round things at the top, it was a square bread. And I was putting it with a toast and I said, hey, this will do. So this is my latest, uh, this is my latest work that I've been working on, Erica. And, uh, you know, um, 
Here we go. You know, Albers called his series Homage to the Square. Mm -hmm. So I call this Toast to Albers. <laughs> <laughs> to Albert. And he also named. France, I think we're losing your audio. Better? There we go. You're back. Okay. All right. Maybe I covered it. Uh, I was saying that Albert called his series Interaction of Color because he was showing how different, how the same color looked different in different contexts of other colors. So I'm calling this series Interaction of Culture because, again, this is biographical. This is Texas Toast. Uh, I am half, how should I say, I'm half Texan, a fourth Venezuelan, and a fourth Filipino. So this is Texas Toast with the Ube Jam. And I've tried it on different shades of toast in different backgrounds. Um, Erica, do you think we could do a screen share of what I said uh, to you? Yeah, yes. let's do it. Let's see if I, let me, let me pull up that particular one that you shared with me. Yeah, it's called Toast to Albert and it, it just shows you, I, I bought the toaster. I, you know, researched which is the toaster that does the best toasting and I toasted a whole lot of bread over here. <laughs> And why, why, uh, why the medium of paint of painting versus photography? This is photography, but you know it's mounted on wood because Albert's did all of his um, Albert's did all of his uh, series on on wood. Okay. And, um, and then I tried are. doing. Yeah, just go ahead and scroll up, and you'll okay. see all of them. See. See how the background changes the same thing. Right. Yeah. And are these and, these are all these are all photographs that all six on one, and then it goes to the end. Yeah, and then I'm doing some diptychs because then if you scroll up a bit to that purple diptych. You know, it became a little about race again and color, right? At the at mm -hmm. the right time, you know, it's like here's here's a white and a dark toast, and the same jam on it looks different. Mm -hmm. So it's the whole lens of contextual color, but it's contextual racial color. This is mm -hmm. jam and Texas mm -hmm. toast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's what I'm working on right now. And so. Um, so the so it is about the um you are using you are using photography and then you're placing it on the panels yes it's printed on wood and you know what i learned while i was researching it is that albert's called these color recipes and he wrote in the back the recipe actually so again it becomes food related and by the way the Bauhaus and albert did come to Mills College for a semester over there. Mm -hmm. So there's a sort of legacy. I think mm -hmm. they were in the air and maybe I picked it up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of your work, obviously you, you have used food in the past. And yes. tell us about, so when you, you've you used it as a means of helping us to see different perceptions or views of it as a means to bridge and create discourse. But tell me about experience where you actually have used the food itself. Have you engaged viewers with that? Right. Well, from that chandelier over there, I made an artwork for my cat because there's this story in the Philippines. There's this story about the family who are so poor, all they had to eat was rice. And it's always, uh, it's actually a comic story. It's always told in a comic setting. So all these people had to eat was rice. So what they did was in the table, they hang a dried fish in the middle of it so they could smell it while they were eating rice. And for years, I heard this story and laughed. We always laughed every time. So one day I said, well, what would that look like? So I hung a fish from here 
and my cat liked it. So <laughs> that became, I think, to date, my, <laughs> my most popular artwork, where I do show in a museum, like for my MF show, you walk into this museum, you know, you walk into the museum and you think, oh my God, all of these artists have spent two and a half years. What did they learn? And you come in and you see one string with one fish, <laughs> a real fish. <laughs> and they were like, geez, you spent $80,000 for that? And yes. <laughs> there's so always, there's always a story behind the story, I, I'm sure. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah. What amazed me was, of course, I had this cookie professor who insisted on trying the rice and the smelling, so we all did, and sure enough, it's one way for a visual artwork to enter your, your, um, your gustatory system, if you will. It's not only the olfactory, but you could actually taste that fish mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in a nice way. Um, you, so a lot of your work, obviously, you've talked about the, the importance of color. And so I think within the context of Filipino food, which was what our exhibition was about and how that was yeah. also, um, a means of us exploring our culture, but also our space here in the United States and how that's perceived and even the, you know, as you say, the story, um, kind of the hierarchy of food in Western culture and this idea that your story is based on the experience of a poor family. Um, but you've also celebrated that with the ice cream and the ube and, um, and the hollow hollow. And that has yeah. three different colors. And you shared with us, can we talk a little bit about, I saw you shared with us an experience where you brought a group together and they actually, yeah. so I'm yes. gonna bring up uh, those pictures. If you sure. talk to us about that, I would love it. Okay, good. Find it. And let's see, I'm gonna close that out. Let's see if I can open this one. Okay, so we have you here. Tell us a little bit about Make Your Own Hollow Hollow. And can you tell us what Hollow Hollow is? I don't know if everybody will know. <laughs> sure. Hollow Hollow is the national Philippine dessert. And what it is, is it's a parfait composed of many different ingredients. You have sweet beans, you have leche flan, you have uh, strings of coconut, you have, um, this pearls from the uh, coconut tree, and you have ube jam, and ice, and condensed milk, and ice cream. It sounds terrible, but actually it's delicious. <laughs> and what I like I about- can, I can attest, it's quite delicious fish. too, yeah. Yes, and everybody should go out and try a halo halo from your neighborhood Filipino store. <laughs> but what's good about it is, I say it's a perfect metaphor for the Philippine culture, because Every ingredient, and they're very colorful, by the way, they're bright orange and bright red and bright green and purple and yellow. Every color there, every ingredient is in the same glass, but it retains its own identity as mm -hmm. you eat it, mm -hmm. you know? And so I do a lot of social practice, and this was one of them. And it's make your own halo halo, because I was thinking of halo halo as an open architecture sort of food, right? Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of flack from some Filipino purists for this. But to me, the whole idea of halo halo, which means, by the way, mix, 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 okay. is that we are a mixed culture. So uh, at, this was at some arts gallery in San Francisco. I had an event, which was make your own halo halo. And I asked participants to say, like, if we had a Filipino American halo halo, what ingredient? would they bring and would they like to see in a halo halo? Ah. Like to add to it, like I said, open architecture. So, you know, we so, might have gum, gummy bears or Cheetos uh -huh. or Rice Krispies because Rice Krispies is very similar to pinipig, right? We mm -hmm. have what we call pinipig in the Philippines, which is green rice popped. So we had this event and um, we had people come and make their own halo halo. And in exchange, because I do a lot of food exchange, they had to tell me their food memories and stories. Uh -huh. And I do this a lot. I have what I call the ube trade as well, 
which I've done in a few museums, which is, I have a whole banquet of ube. Ube, by the way, is a purple yam. It's a very sweet purple yam. And I trade you. You can have as much sweets as you want, but you have to give me a story. Ah. You have to tell me a food memory. Okay. And so you'd be surprised, see. you know. You have these right. strong, huge men bodybuilders come with all their tattoos and biker outfits and they tell me about <laughs> their mom's cooking and they cry. <laughs> we all cry. You know? right, right. There's something about, I guess, a memory is anchored by both smell and taste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So unfortunately, it's, it's, so, it's so wonderful to see these images. That seems like such a long time ago when we could share a space like this. Um, and food and eat together. Um, so it's here, everybody's sitting together and, and uh, enjoying the food. What sorts of, um, what sorts of research do you capture from this with the stories that are told to you and how do those come out in the work that you make? Well, right now I've just collected these stories. I have maybe close to a hundred of them. And I'm still thinking about the best way to share them. Mm -hmm. Because one thing about the story is really, the artwork is not in the story. The artwork is in the feeling you get when you tell that story. Mm -hmm. Because it, there's a movement in you, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm going to do it to you right now, Eric. I'm going to put you okay. on the spot. Okay. Tell me a food memory. <laughs> tell me oh, a memory wow. of food. Well, of course it would be related to Filipino food. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would probably say, I'd probably say the first time, you know, growing up, growing up American with a Filipino mom and a big Filipino family, eating was a major part of what we did. But I was always, I was always conflicted because I didn't want Filipino food. I wanted American food. Right my mom would make me Filipino food and it was like, just try it, just try it. And <laughs> what you associate with being sweet in American food is very different with Filipino food. But I, re I can recall specifically the first time um, I tried, gosh, so many different things, but the two things, one sweet and one that I just promised I would never try. The sweet was the, was the babinka. Yes. I, it just didn't look like something that would be sweet. And so when I did finally taste it, that was it. I was sold, you know? Yeah. That, that opened up to, well, I guess I can try other things. And then now I can remember asking my mom, and only my mom can make the babinka that I like. I can't buy it from the store. I've tried. I can't. <laughs> and then the other one would be things that, you know, and that's, that's always been, and I think that's something we discussed in Super Sarap, our, our, our show, the idea of presentation, right? There are a lot of things. Presentation is not part of what we do, but it's about the taste and the gathering and the, you know, so we see a lot of big pots of things. And sometimes yeah. those things look exceptionally scary, like, like a black stew, you know, didn't go on. I was like, there is no possible way you were going to get me to eat that. <laughs> what it is, but I'm definitely not sold. But I yeah. can eat one and babinka, my two, the things that I would, that I never would try until I think I was probably about 10 and then can never give up. So those are things that for me kind of, and also it's a, it's a trigger of embracing your culture, being right. America. And right. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing. That was very interesting. And you know, they go together. Bibinka I know. And <laughs> <laughs> you can dip your bibinka in your dinuguan, <laughs> like Pluto, you know? That's true. That, that's just the beginning. But I think that, you know, and I think that a lot of artists, especially, you know, we talk a lot about with artists who um, are not from the United States or in the United States, but who have a different culture or background, that there is this liminal space that no one else can understand except for you because you are reconciling where you fit in, as though you have to, which is an entirely different discussion. 
but a lot of artists are trying to convey and represent that feeling or that experience. And I think a lot of that can be easily understood if you if you do look at at the memories and the experiences of food. Right. Home right. The culture, the furniture that was in your home. Nostalgia plays a huge part. And I think that's a lot of what your work is talking about. Right. And you know, that brings me, uh, I want to talk about a work based on that, which is like for us first, you know, who actually grew up in another country and moved here. We have a really strong connection to our culture, but I'm dealing now with a lot of people who were born here, right? Mm -hmm. Who are only now trying to reach back and claim that culture. And I think that is really a trend now. Uh, I work with a group and we have like uh, youth leadership for the next generation and we have like an in cultural immersion. I think this is every culture, Jewish culture, uh, any other culture, they're trying to have to find a way for the next generation who grew up here to be able to claim the heritage. And I'm part of um, this uh, Soma Filipinas, which is just a couple of years ago, uh, San Francisco designated a cultural district in the South Market as the Filipino, as a Filipino cultural district. And so the question is, how do you uh, bring that culture in, in a modern way? And we actually got an NEA grant to uh, have some designs and I participated in that. And I'd like, I'd like to show you some. So okay. that is our artist, um, Stephen, can we show them? Houses. Great. So what we did here was I said, all right, what does the Filipino, how would, how would you know people are Filipino in this, in this area? You know, like what, what could we show? And I thought here, one thing about the Filipino culture is we're very punny. We <laughs> like to <do> puns. <laughs> and so this is an upo. An upo is a, a gourd. Again, it's a squash and it's called upo. And it so happens that upuan is seat. So there's a, there's a pun there, upo, upuan. So I thought of a seat that looked like an upo. And by the way, I got really excited when I was reading the Upanishads because apparently Upanishad means to sit, but it wasn't the Upa, it was the Shad, the shad that was to sit. <laughs> so I'm thinking maybe we'll have some Upu Upuans and read the Upanishads in the, you know, the <laughs> cultural thing. And then, uh, you know, if you look at this big spoon and fork, just stay here, I'm gonna go get mine. You know, in every Filipino household, there's this spoon and fork. Hold up. I'm going to bring my spoon and fork here. Erica, <laughs> did you ever see this when you were in the Philippines? My mom had one. I, I think I saw it in hours. Yeah. <laughs> so it's this large spoon and fork, and I thought, well, what if we had at the boundaries, at the very boundaries of this cultural district, a large spoon and fork? Again, it's about radical hospitality that we've set the table for you. Come on right. in. Yeah. You know, and of course, they're going to be purple ube. So those were some of my concepts. And over here is, this is the, uh, uh, the oldest jar found in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And it's really beautiful. It has these ancestors, you know, in a boat. And it, yeah. it's about the journey to life. And again, I thought, if we made chairs of this, mm -hmm. it would say that you're sitting in the boat with them. Like we're all in the same boat. Yes. You know, we're all immigrants in the same boat. And it's actually a journey through life. It's not from one place to another. That's all what we're doing. We're rowing. Yes. And then this is the Filipino alphabet, the Babayin, we call it. It was an ancient alphabet. Uh, just let me put this down a minute. And uh, I thought if we made some patterns with it, it would be interesting. And again, about claiming your heritage. This is where I, I'm going to show you this. Um, I think this is more real because where do we see this babayin? We, we never really see it, right? Mm -hmm. When was the last time you saw a babayin? We only see it on screens. 
you know, our culture mm -hmm. is like our mother is the internet. So I'm working on I'm working on something that's a little more like this whole idea of the screen resolution. And you know, another another thing I want to tell you about is uh, I'm trying to bridge both cultures, the Filipino and the Venezuelan. Mm -hmm. And I was really happy when I went to the rehang of the MoMA in New York. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've been yet. No. Um, there's a whole room of Venezuelan artists and they're all doing off art and they're all doing red and green like this. And so I said, oh, I must have channeled them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there you go. I think you've definitely captured so many, so many nuances of the culture that make a difference. And it's so many things that we don't realize until someone helps us to do that. I think that is part of the, the reclamation, but also it's, I guess I agree with you. I think a lot of artists who either came here very, very young or are first gen here are very much in the midst of that journey and that exploration to understand, you know, taking the trip back to the Philippines, talking to their grandparents, talking to their parents, asking questions. And an attempt to understand better what that means. But I think, again, it's also to understand and experience what it means to be blank American, whether it's exactly. Filipino American, African American, whatever that means, it gives yeah. us a better understanding, but a greater, a greater sense of place and space. But it is an empowering journey, right? It is. It's not something that has. It's always been emphasized that we are a melting pot, but it never emphasized how we became that way for everyone. Right. And, and you know, we're all constructing our identities. That's the big art, right? I mean, like the young people, first you might put it on as a costume, but then at some point, you know, the paradigm shifts. Right. And it becomes you. That's right. right. That's right. That's right. And I think, you know, a lot of this too are all of the questions that come with that and that the answers are not readily available. And I think right. that's part of the motivation and the discovery that takes place and how all of what's going on are dots that are being connected. Right. It's always and, and, been there. It, and it's the whole idea that we're not talking about Filipino history. Here. We're talking about American history. You know, we're changing what it means to be American. And again, let me talk to you about the food, right? When you say, okay, what's your American food? Hamburgers and pizza, uh, hot dogs and pizza. Well, hot dogs were Frankfurters. They were the German immigrants before they were considered German food. And pizza, it's only like maybe in the last 20 years, it was considered American. Before it was pizza pie, it was Italian food, right? Okay. So... I'm thinking that eventually we're going to have purple yams at our Thanksgiving dinner. It's just going to be, that's right. It's just going to be American. That's right. Oh, that's by right. the way, as American as apple pie, that's something I've been wanting to make an artwork about. The whole idea of American as apple pie, there were no apples in America. The whole idea is that the apples were brought here, that it's an immigrant food, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And that, and I think, you know, what you're hitting on is that that you're right. That is our culture that everything was created here. Palm trees in California are not native to California. <laughs> it's just, right. it's like, and it's very appropriate for it to be in Los Angeles because that is one of the most diverse places that people from other countries come to. It's, and, it, and it's illusion, it's an illusion. It is the city that creates the illusion of what, of what exactly. it is, you know? Um, yeah. And so tell me a little bit of, about how the, you know, you've talked a little bit about the ube and the square and the toast. What, there are some other applications. You sent me some images of um, other ways in which you have extended or expanded the, the idea or around the ube. Um, can we share and talk about those? Sure, let, let me talk about these two over here. Let me talk about the neon okay. signs, first of all. Okay. And, you know, uh, I do a lot of workshops with Jean Houston, who's a mythologist. And she was uh, a colleague of Joseph Campbell. 
And she says, at some point, you can be seized by an archetype, right? The archetype seizes you. And so, like, you're, you're suddenly almost possessed by it. And that happened to me twice here, and I'm going to show them both to you. Once with the Bulos, uh, the rice gods, and once with Ube. And suddenly, like, Ube was on my mind all the time. And, you know, oh, can we show them my plant? This is the, probably the only Ube plant in, in, in California right now. Wow. Maybe in the entire um, uh, sort of continental U.S., I don't know. And why but, is that? Why is that? Well, only this, only I would say two years ago, for the first time ever, the demand for ube was so big that Hawaiian farmers started to grow it. Because there's always been the Japanese purple yam, right? And um, you have several versions of sweet potatoes that are purple. But this is Diaspora alata. This is the ube actual plant. And, you know, I grew it by mistake. And if you want to show that, that's the... Um, the one that sprouted in my Louis Vuitton. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it's related to Soma Filipino. Okay, so. so. Uh, yes, to set it up, to set this up, again, we had just made this cultural district, okay? Mm -hmm. And so like, we're, we're Filipinizing it and we're in this meeting, we're in this, I mean, the cultural committee, I'm sitting in this meeting where everybody says, okay, what does it look like when Filipinos move into the neighborhood, right? And Filipinos, as you know, are very fashionable. So I look around and I don't see one by one. All I see are Louis Vuitton and, and uh, you know, Valentino bags and all of that. So I said, all right, let's have a, a pasial, which is a paseo. You know, in, in Hong Kong, uh, they walk their birds. So I said, what if we walked our ube? <laughs> up and down up the corridors of Soma, you know? So just to let them know that, hey, we're here. Um, <laughs> so I got my friends with their fancy bags. So go ahead and show it. So I had them, we walked up and down, you know, like near the Boma. There's my little. <laughs> <laughs> and we walked with our ube. And I lent her my Louis Vuitton for this. And she walked my ube. And then, uh, you know, this was almost at the end of the semester. I forgot about it completely for months and I opened my bag and the thing had sprouted can you believe wow. that I mean it's wow. just unbelievable it had sprouted so I grew that and then I was able since then you know every year I get one or two ubes from there's a place in Monterey only in Monterey that used to have them from Hawaii and so I've been growing them that's amazing and that's, so the plant behind you is from this sprout right here. No, that's not, this is the third generation. Third generation, okay. Yeah, so that one grew about, you know, this is the first one that actually took root. The okay. two I was able to grow in glass and water. Okay. But this one actually take root. And, you know, I'm trying to commune with it. I'm trying to see what it wants to tell me. <laughs> but sorry, that was a, a diversion. I wanted to talk about my neon sign. Okay. So... This plant, I said, is a lowly root. It goes under the ground. And I'm sorry I didn't have a piece for you now because uh, since COVID, they don't have any. But I do have the jam. And um, I said, you were talking about Hollywood. It's having a moment, right? It's like when kiwi or kale, Ube is having a moment. And it's everywhere. So I said, this lowly root is now a celebrity. And how do you, how do you celebrate celebrity? status you have your name in lights right <laughs> so i mean lights for it and i said you know like people have their corn goddess and their wheat goddess so we need an ube goddess right and so i i did this and, and this was in there was a show uh my curator friend glenn had a show on prince he loves prince and the rumor is prince is part filipino so this was my entry to the prince show it's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> and That's then I have one more thing. I have one okay. more little thing over here, which are these. And I don't know if you can come a little closer. And what I did was I, I looked at it under the microscope. You know, I tried to see, okay, what is the essence there? Is there something in there? But I said, as I was explaining it, that it seemed that the closer you got, 
the more cosmic it got. Mm -hmm. And my colleague, um, my colleague in my class made a postcard out of that, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> and then one last thing here, uh, if we can show this. Um, uh, what I did was, again in Soma, I filled the cracks in the pavement with ube jam. Because uh. the whole idea is that it's oozing out from the historical layers under. Mm -hmm. So those are my ube stories. And here's what the jam looks like if you want to go to your grocery and find some. Okay. Yes. That may be a hard call where we are, but we can find it. Not to go outside of our border. Oh, really? You don't have a big, you don't have a big community over there? No, no. You'll have to come over and help us, help us start that. And the, um, there are some works that you had on your opposite wall. Yes. I first seen the work that our curator, uh, Patricia Karina Valdez had shared. You had recently done really more of an installation. And you had talked about, um, I'm gonna pull up the pictures because I think you did send me something. But it was the work that I had originally seen you um, oh, is that my Black Madonna's work? Yes. Okay. Let's, so let's, let's talk about put it that. Up, then we'll move around. Yeah. Yeah. So we can have a really good sense of the the depths of your work here. So shall I start with this one? Yes. Yeah, start with that. Let me tell you okay. the story of that. Okay. What, well, first of all, since I don't think you've seen this before, what does it look like to you? If you had to guess. Um, again, it looks like one of, it, it, it has a very, like, stellar, it looks like a planet. Or it could look like a nipple. <laughs> yes, you got it. You got it. <laughs> all right, because the story behind this is this. I said, you know, all my imagination has been colonized by the Renaissance, right? When, what this, what would God look like if I had never seen any art historical references of, you know, Michelangelo mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, Raphael's Madonna. Like, if I had to come up with a visual of what God would look like and I had never seen anything, what, that was the, the question I asked myself. And so I said, well, first of all, it would be female, something that gave birth, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it would be nurturing. So I said, well, what is the, the sort of like symbol of nurturing? And again, I was in a Jean Houston workshop and I go into the bathroom and there's my friend nursing her baby. And I'm like, yes, you know, mother and child, but let's just get to really the crux of the relationship here. <laughs> it's the nurturing, right? So she posed for me. She posed for me, that's actual uh -huh. man. You know, uh -huh. so nice of her. And then I put it on the constellation of Virgo. So it's a black Madonna. Mm. This is my black Madonna. So yeah, this, this cosmic stellar connection seems to be a through line. It's, it's um, I do a lot of black Madonnas. I love the idea. I'm doing a lot of Jungian um, art right now. The whole idea of your subconscious and uh, I, you know, I started with my rice gods. Are, are we back to looking? Over yeah, we're here? looking at you only. I can pull up the other ones once you've shown us these. Okay, so here's, here are the rice gods. Um, that, again, this is sort of like, I'm very interested when gods lose, lose their, um, their god status mm -hmm. and the opposite when they're brought back to life and like these are philippine rice gods can we walk over here i'll show you some so here are some philippine rice gods they're called balloons and these were these are venerated in the field right mm -hmm. to ensure a good harvest and this particular one was brought to me by ben cab you know the national artist who has a bulo museum in the philippines and what the spaniards did terrible thing is they actually made their students go home and destroy the rice guys or at least cut off the 
penis and the balls. So I gave this guy new balls. Yes, I think he needed some. That so anyway, <laughs> and I was saying, uh, the thing about rice gods is I think of like the tiki doll. You, you, mm -hmm. go to a, you go to a restaurant and the tiki doll is a drink now, where it used to be a god, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're seeing Buddhas more and more in the gardens. And you associate them with having cucumber on your eyes and a sparrow. So it's, it's sort of like you're demoting them. And so you're secularizing them. Mm. And so I wanted to, if you go back here, I wanted to reanimate the blue. And I thought, how could I do that? And it would be like with a bolt of lightning, probably from a neon sign. So I tried something like that. Uh. Again, this might be too literal. That's why I haven't put it there. But it leads you somewhere else, right? There's something mm -hmm. about art. You start one way, then you go to the next step. It leads you there. I'm going to pull up the, the images you sent. So okay. we can look at them a little bit closer. So okay. the Black Madonna, the, the first. Yes. And then and the, these are some images. Oh, from, yes. I don't have those here. What those are, and I wish I had, but they're in my studio. I, I have another studio in Minnesota, but because of COVID, we are, um, you know, it's not safe to be in there. And these are... Ma Black Madonnas, which we have four in the Philippines, and we have, there are about 500 in Spain and all of that. And I love the Black Madonna because to me, it's the unconquered heart of the colonized country. It's that part that the colonizers could not get to, right? They could put the facade of a Madonna, but under it, and in some places, literally, under the cloths were the old, first religions under them. Mm -hmm. And these particular ones, I found a process of UV printing that when you look from one direction, they're positive. And when you look from another direction, the, the image turns negative, mm -hmm. which again is, is our relationship to the divine, right? Depends on your right. position. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to go through. Oh, I got to tell you about is that this, one. Is this ladder? Is that from the Philippines? Yes, I have it right here. It's an authentic ladder. It's an authentic, uh, it used to belong to David Baradas, who's one of the most important uh, anthropologists over there. Yeah, so this is my little ladder. Mm. And I love, I love ladders. I love the idea of ladders. They use it to go into their house. This one is more a uh, ritual. I don't think they could use this one. Okay. And can I tell you the story about this one? Yes, tell us the story. Okay, this one is a real miracle. The story of this one is I started, again, I was working with what does God look like, you know, the whole idea of, of uh, our images of the divine. And uh, I was thinking of the Reformation and how Martin Luther tacked 95 theses to a wall, you know, as part of the, what started the Reformation. And so I got a Madonna because they didn't like the Madonnas. And I started to put 95 males in her. And after about the third or fourth, you know, my religious upbringing came up. I said, I can't do this. I, I, can't, I, can't, put, I can't nail uh, even a picture of a, a real Madonna. So I said, well, what can I do? So then I went back to the Venus of Willendorf, which is at some point it was like the oldest fertility goddess that we have. And I said, well, I can do that. So I nailed 95 holes in this Venus. And I looked at it and it was nice artwork. What was nicer was when you took it out, there were nails, holes on the door. And again, I forgot about it. But I, I held, I put the, the piece with all the holes in it in the window. And then I noticed the light was shining through it. And so this is the picture, it's blurred. These are actually, it's a pinhole camera. And these are actually the light coming through the whole deity. So this was almost like, I don't know, a little mir miraculous image here. The idea that when you wound the deity, the light shines through. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, Glenn looked at this and he said, it looks like disco Venus. You made her beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. I love the idea that she became sort of like the disco ball. Yes, yes. 
And it seems as though within within your work, there's always some. It seems like there's always some photography in your in your work. Is there's a lot of photography in my work because I find it it's um it's the easiest way to tell a story. Sometimes, I mean, like I'm I'm doing a little uh, painting now of the uh, alphabet, right? Which I'm I'm looking at undecipherable alphabet. So that's that's painting, but. There's a lot of photography, there's a lot of installation, there's neon. What else is there? You know, there's the social practice, there's the gesture of, of putting food on the sidewalks. That's what I mean by I have quite a diverse uh, practice. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us, you know, in the midst of all of this, there is a pandemic going on, yeah. which I'm sure had some impact on you. How was that in terms of your practice and working during the pandemic? How has that affected or has it impacted or influenced your work or affected you? How has that been? I think the biggest difference is I, I used to, because I consider myself an art historian, I used to go to three or four or five openings and gallery shows a week, right? I would say see 500 artworks in any given week. And I've had none of that, you know? And it's refreshing, you know? It's refreshing because you get to really stop and think about what you might want to do. And you get back to nature. I grew this plant, you know, I grew this plant, I grew other plants, I became a gardener. Um, it hasn't affected my practice that much other than because um, I do a lot of work alone in my studio and I'm, you know, I need a lot of time alone. But that whole uh, break from the art world has been refreshing, I think. Yeah, I, thought, I think that's a theme that I've heard um, pretty, pretty, pretty often from artists that we've talked to uh, that there's there's a bit of liberation from the the pressure or the burden or the obligation of always having to produce there is there are very you know it just kind of it had to stop and that moment to pause has been um as you said i think an a, an opportunity to refresh to replenish to really start to have an op i guess have that time to think and reflect that you don't usually have so Absolutely. And it's a period of intense experimentation for me, you know, I'm trying all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing things like collages, which, you know, there's this thing called soul collage, and I do them because you can't, you're not, you're not allowed to sell them or share them. You know, like, what, what kind of art would you do if you could share them, sell them, you know, it's just really about a dialogue with your subconscious. Right. It's right. like a diary. And it frees right. you, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I know, as I said, this always goes quickly. We only have a couple more minutes. I'm wondering, you know, we've had the opportunity to learn more about your practice, where you have come along this journey. Is there anything that you can think of that we should know that we don't know about you? Oh, well, I think, I think what I want to emphasize is that I, I approach things mythologically. And it's almost like I'm, I'm more interested in mythology than art sometimes, you know what I mean? And it's like this whole dialogue with the mythological, I think, is what I want to come through even more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what's the most important thing you think you've learned through your practice to this point? The most important thing you think you've oh. learned through your practice? I think the most important thing I've learned is to trust the process and that it's a dialogue. Like I always say, you start in one place, it leads you to another, right? You respond to that, it leads you back. So I came from a graphic design background also. So in graphic design, it's very different. You have, you have a brief, you have an idea, you execute it, right? And it's like your, your success is based on that trajectory. This way is more of a dialogue. Right. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to solve anything. You're try trying to problematize solutions, mm -hmm. easy solutions. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what I've learned. And the one thing that Mills really drilled into me, which I find very useful is 
don't don't uh, be didactic. Don't tell them what they should think or feel. Give them an experience, right? Mm -hmm. Have people feel what you're trying to say. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you're really looking forward to learning in your practice? Well, the one thing I wanted to learn, because I, a couple of years ago, I went to the National Portrait Gallery in London and I saw the Michael Jackson exhibit and it was all like a hundred portraits on him and I said you know I really avoided portraiture as a genre and I really want to try how to do portraits and I'm working on a self-portrait now maybe I'll show it to you it's it's not quite there yet but okay. again it's pretty conceptual okay so can go over there yeah and um so this is a piece it's it's two mirrors and each, it's a, the purple yam, and the, um, see that? It's the purple yam and the yellow uh, yam, and it's a yes. tail of yams, yes. you know? Yes, yes. Well, I think we're losing your audio. Bless her. Okay. Oops. I we still aren't hearing you. Oh, I'm sorry. There we are. Okay, there. You're fine. Okay. I was just saying it has to be at the wall that intersects. Mm -hmm. Because the idea that you're this intersection of two cultures. That's right. That's right. So that's a portrait I'm working on. And maybe I want to do your portrait, Erica. Uh-oh. Uh oh! <laughs> I knew she was going. She's gonna. You have to tell me about yourself. She was going to toss the hook out there. Um, <laughs> at, at at you know at this particular point, I I think um, we're really interested in what's you're working on portraiture. You're working on self portraits. Are there any particular projects or shows that you're working toward or preparing for? or anything particular that you're looking forward um, to that you would want to share with us in terms of following you and, and your practice? Um, I, I am taking a break until the end of the year to do some experimentation. So I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that that's good news. We're happy to hear that you're that you are still working and there's so many things that you're doing and I think that the expanse of how you have exploited what we think of when we think of Ube or or the the creation you know of our planet and how this works I think is pretty amazing you know um, I have a special place in my heart for conceptual art so um, I get really excited to see it, but more importantly, we were just really pleased and very grateful for you letting us into your studio space. Oh, thank you very much, Erica. This is wonderful. So, as always, um, we are looking forward to at another time, maybe, um, you know, next year when we can see what this time actually um, produced for you. So, I'm hoping yeah. we can check in check in with you again but um of course you and i will always stay in touch and connected but I, again i want to thank you for your time and um i definitely want people to take advantage of seeing this archived on our bcrc youtube page but until then owen franz viana stay well stay safe and thank you thank you very much thank you erica thank you take all. good care Bye-bye.